in terms of the imperfect decision making, I think that's actually historically of why Asianism came to be. Mm -hmm. We're bad at expressing our beliefs. We're bad at dealing with uncertainties. Humans are in general pretty bad at making these decisions. So Asianism is in a way like trying to make it a little bit more formal, so we get a little bit more guided. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm in an org that runs experiments, and I want to try Bayesian. Then what should I do? The first thing you want to start with is come up with a prior. And this could be expressed as something very simple. After doing all that stuff, our conclusion is there's a 90% chance that this is a 5% lift, uh -huh. and there's a 10% chance this is a minus 5% lift. Uh -huh. Well, that's your bet right in front of you. And the decision maker should treat it as a bet. I see. And figure out like if this is a reasonable bet for the company. Hi, Kenneth. Welcome to PDS. Nice to talk to you, Yijun. Kenneth is a statistician at Meta. He graduated from UC Berkeley as a math PhD and then was doing research on experimentation at Meta for four and a half years now, right? Right. Great. And uh, there are a lot of uh, fundamental things in experimentation that I feel like uh, should be taught, but are not really taught uh, in schools. And uh, today is our opportunity to uh, get our opinions on those topics. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I can think of uh, two topics. One is Bayesian and one is Qubit. Yes, of course. Yeah, happy to talk about those two things. Certainly encounter those a lot in a lot of settings and I from what I see every year at conferences, those are things that keep showing up uh -huh. in many repeated themes. And probably not only from conferences, right, but also in applications. Let's start with Bayesian. And Kenneth, can you give us a very high level introduction of what Bayesian is? Yeah. So when we do statistical analysis, you would usually want to be objective. So you look at your data and you try to get some summaries based on the data. However, under a lot of situations where either you don't have that much information or a particular analysis is just not feasible mm -hmm. with the data that you have, then you kind of need to inject uh, a little bit of subjectivity to it. Mm. And how you can do that is express it in terms of a prior. Mm. So the usual Bayesian workflow would be you have some prior beliefs. You believe like this is how the state of world looks like. Mm -hmm. You collect a little bit of data, and Bayesians usually would call that your likelihood. Mm -hmm. You would combine your prior with your likelihood into something called a posterior, which is how you should believe mm -hmm. about the world after you have seen the data. So something as simple as that could be, say, going into the presidential elections. We don't really have a strong belief one way or the other, so I'll set my prior to be like 50-50% of who wins. But upon going around the US asking various people how they're going to vote, and if I have a mental model of how I'm meeting these people, then I get my data and I translate that into a likelihood. Mm -hmm. Combining the two would allow me to get a posterior, mm -hmm. which would say something like, okay, I think uh, maybe it's a little bit more like 51, 49%. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll make decisions accordingly. So it's really about expressing a prior. Everyone is subjective and people try to influence the decision making in their subjective ways. Bayesian is kind of a disciplined way of doing this. That's mm -hmm. why we have a prior and we want to express that prior. But two, I think more importantly, Bayesian is about being realistic about the world. Um, it's about updating a, a prior. The prior is subject to change. And uh, by being a Bayesian, you just by default accept these premises of my prior is there to be challenged and to be changed. Right, yeah. I think being a Bayesian kind of is, means to be open-minded, mm -hmm. means that you are willing to change your prior beliefs and willing to be open about what your beliefs are. And as opposed to like certain more traditional practices in, in frequentism where a lot of assumption still goes into things, yeah. but you're not explicit about it. Things like, oh, I'm going to assume everything is Gaussian. That's an assumption. Mm -hmm. When I make assumptions like, oh, I should take a log transform of my data before mm -hmm. I do analysis. Well, that is also really an assumption. We're mm -hmm. just not making it explicit. We just hand wave it and say, oh, that's just data cleaning. Don't worry about it. And look at my shiny lift that is 5% at the end. <laughs> okay, I see. Oh. Wow, 
Because I, I do know if you employ enough techniques, you can make any results happen from a data set. But yeah, I never thought about it as being, you know, not explicit about our assumptions. Right. I mean, usually when you see someone, and, and this applies like, equally well to like scientific paper where they show the analysis at the end, all they do is like, look at my nice p-value. Yeah. Look at how strong of an effect I found. They don't tell you that much about how they clean the data. They don't tell you about like how they transform the data. These days they get a little bit better than that, mm. but it's still a lot of implicit assumptions going into this. You also don't say anything about like why I chose that, like why I chose log transform instead of a square root transform. Bayesianism is a way to make these very upfront. You have one single object that everyone should look at mm -hmm. and try to challenge it. And if everyone can agree this is like a reasonable prior, or at least not too far from their own beliefs, mm -hmm. then everyone should ideally agree with the result. There is a debate. The debate is Bayesian can make things better. But on the other side, when you drop the term Bayesian, a lot of people, stakeholders, if they don't understand Bayesian, they have less trust mm -hmm. in the methodology. And then there are also a group of data scientists, I call them pedantic data scientists. <laughs> we are the pragmatic data scientists. That's the, they like to drop the term Bayesian to make them sound smart, but sometimes used in wrong applications. So what is our experience of you know, having this research, seeing at conferences, and watching it being applied day to day at Meta? So I can't say too much to the application of Bayesianism, but mm -hmm. I think of it as Bayesianism is a good way for us to integrate many different sources of information. So for example, you can run an experiment and all you see is your test group has this average and your control group has this average. You compare them. That's like the only piece of information that you use. And if you're happy with that, that's fine. If mm -hmm. you feel like that's actually good enough for most of your needs in terms of understanding what's going on, Great, yeah, good for you. You don't need to think about anything fancier. But under certain situations, you really want to integrate other sources of information. So an example of like information that you might want to integrate is what about the past experiments you have run? Suppose this is not the first time I tried this idea. I've tried this like 10 other times with like slightly iterations and like modifications. Then all the past experiments should kind of guide you in your final experiment readouts. Mm -hmm. You need to integrate all of the information and not discarding them because they would be helpful in making a decision. But then I guess that's the tricky part. It's easy to gain, but applying past information, there is no one single right answer. Then in corporate environment, people like to, you know, chase their metrics. Mm -hmm. So they will cherry pick the version that is most suitable to them. And integrating past experiment information, I think, is less problematic because the data is already there. But what about integrating business sense? Like, for example, I get a business input from a partner. Like my VP says, this should be positive. Right. <laughs> Your <laughs> estimation is negative, it's wrong. <laughs> how, how strong should I integrate that signal and mm -hmm. prior? Yeah, so no, I, I think that's a, that's a great question and you're not alone. I, I don't think that's even like unique to corporate setting. If you look at what any academics who work on econometrics or like any sort of measurements, if they do any sort of Bayesianism, the first thing that always shows up is there would be a huge debate of like, I don't trust your prior. I think your setting is wrong. But I think of that as like a more, more of a feature than a bug in, in the sense that like, if the signal is really obvious, if your experiment has really strong positive signal, you wouldn't really need to think so hard about like integrating all information. You wouldn't need to think so hard about making sure we did not like leave any information unused. Mm -hmm. You can tell, like you might not even need to run a t-test. You mm -hmm. can just do a plot and see like control over here, test over here, definitely a signal. With confidence intervals. Right, with some confidence intervals there. Yeah. Now, on, on the other hand, if you're signal is not as obvious. That's when you start doing statistics, you start doing frequentist stuff. And if you can still tell with a t-test, you probably would be happy with that. I think where Bayesianism comes to shine is when you start to have more of a gray zone. Things are kind of close to being statsig, but not quite. And you 
don't really know if like we should really be shipping this or not. Mm -hmm. Then you start to look for other information. Mm -hmm. so, so I have never been to any sort of like experimentation review myself where people like argue about these things. But I imagine a lot of it comes down to using side information. Someone would say like, I have done something similar to this before it worked. Let's do this. Like, I think this is going to work. There's a lot of these like implicit information that people are already putting into how they read the experiment. And in a way, Bayesianism allows us to make it explicit how we want to use this information. Oh, we I can see. write down a prior and say, I really don't think this experiment is going to give us 5% swift. Like, that's just impossible. Like, don't include that in the analysis. Where someone else might come in and say, well, I think this experiment is probably going to be mostly neutral. Well, put a little bit more mass around mm -hmm. in your prior around the zero. Mm -hmm. And that would kind of make it scientific, scientifically consistent mm -hmm. and make sure everyone can see what your belief really is instead of using hand wavy terms. That's good. And we can talk about once we have that prior, the techniques of incorporating in the estimation. But even before that, another philosophical question, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> I like the theoretical uh, framing of uh, make my prior explicit, but that has a kind of assumption that my decision can be expressed as formulas, the inputs, mm -hmm. the parameters. But often, like what I come to realize is humans are really bad at dealing with complex decisions mm -hmm. too. Our math is not advanced to <laughs> as advanced to you know just have formula for everything. When there are a lot of people making decisions on impacting a lot of people, when the parameter space gets high, it's hard, hard to you know write down a formula. And three, most of the data that can impact the decision may not be observable. So in terms of the imperfect decision making, I think that's actually historically of why like Bayesianism came to be. Mm -hmm. We're bad at expressing our beliefs. We're bad at dealing with uncertainties. There's like a few paradoxes that like Bayesian has written over the years mm -hmm. on how like given say two, two options, people would choose one over the other. And then if we slightly tweak the options, people would somehow choose the other way, even though that's like inconsistent. Yep. Humans are in general pretty bad at making these decisions. So, Bayesianism is in a way like trying to make it a little bit more formal so we get a little bit more guided, uh, mm -hmm. but not to say that it's perfect. Uh, I mean, part of doing statistics is you do one thing and then you realize that my analysis was actually not quite right. Uh, some of the assumptions doesn't hold um, and then you go and fix that. Um, it's just that instead of saying assumptions being not quite right in the case of Bayesianism, you would go back and change your prior a little bit because you realize some of your knowledge about how the world works, some of your prior beliefs just doesn't seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. So I guess then it's more important to do that in a disciplined way because otherwise you are just using, you are just hanging the results and maybe your promotions mm -hmm. to guide <laughs> the process. Right, yeah. yeah. So here, of course, we're assuming a little bit more of a, an altruistic decision maker mm -hmm. where I'm not trying to get a product shipped mm -hmm. to get a promotion. I'm thinking a little bit more like, okay, what is really the best thing to mm -hmm. do in this case for, for the company, for a corporation? And of course, once you have a little bit more incentives in it, I can see people tweaking the priors to, mm -hmm. to match certain beliefs they have. But I think, yeah, the, the bonus in the, the good thing about Bayesianism is that you have one single object that you yeah. can argue about mm -hmm. and everyone can go in and argue why they think that is the case or if that's not the case. Cool. So summarizing what we learned so far, Bayesian is a great technique to incorporate our priors. Incorporating informations uh, do not just exist in our current e uh, experiment. And that is a great technique. Two, Bayesian is flexible, I guess, in a sense. And uh, then it comes down to a managerial decision. Like, do you have people that you trust that want to go to the truth? Or do you, do you feel like people who are doing experiments are incentivized for you know, shipping the products and getting the, that static results? If the latter, then be careful about vision. But suppose 
I can design an organization or a culture that people actually want to get to the bottom, then my question is how to use Bayesian right? Right, yeah. Yeah, uh, assuming that like the organization doesn't present any like challenges in this, then the general workflow would come down to something a little bit like this, where you start with a certain prior first. And this prior could be done in many, many different ways. Like if you are a very firm Bayesian with like years of Bayesian training, you would probably start writing down things like a binomial distribution. Mm -hmm. For example, assume whether people come onto your platform today to be a coin flip, that sort mm. of stuff. Yeah. And then you modify that as you go. Someone might come in and say, oh, but we have a network of mm. users. And if someone goes onto the network, their friends are more likely to also go onto the network. Well, okay, I'll go and change my prior because of that. If you're a little bit more of an empirical Bayesian like I am, <laughs> then what you would probably do is, well, let's go and grab a bunch of experiments in the past that I think is similar to this. So this definition of similarity, of course, is a little bit hand wavy. It could be something down to all the past experiments that are done in this particular product mm -hmm. or all the experiments that are done by this particular person. <laughs> this reminds me of the sizing practice we do at Meta. Like at the beginning of each half, as a data scientist on the product, mm -hmm. we need to size the opportunity. And of course, people have different expectations. For example, how, how much can I move the CTR? Mm -hmm. Then the best thing to do is look at every experiment in this group or this mm -hmm. person has done before. Like, then what is a realistic expectation? Yeah, no, in, in, in a way, like, Bayesianism is kind of similar to how we already think about a lot of these things. Like, every time when you look at old data to see if, you know, to, to just get a sense, like, what, how my experiment is going to turn out here secretly a Bayesian already. Um, yeah. you just, That's you why know, I but... <laughs> actually prefer the empirical Bayesian over the theoretical Bayesian because my belief of, you know, the world is too complex to be written down as formulas or functions. Sorry, yeah. personal view. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can see that. <laughs> okay, so as an empirical Bayesian, which we want to deep dive into, yeah, then you grab all the past experiments and you get a sense, you build a prior using arts, right? Is there a formula? Is there a, like a systematic way of building it or? Yeah, so, so, so a couple of things, and especially for anyone who has proper Bayesian training unlike me, I understand that there are like common strategies to check if a prior fits a set of data. Mm -hmm. So what you have is like, here are a bunch of experiments from the past. I know the point estimates. I know the standard error. And that's your data set mm -hmm. that you want to build a prior on. So following like the usual Bayesian training, I think there are things like posterior predictive check, prior predictive check. There's like a few of these like ways that you can check if a prior fits the data well. Mm -hmm. And with that, you can try to start with like a really simple prior, something that looks like a normal distribution, for example. And then you may realize, okay, that doesn't quite look right. Let's uh, tweak it a little bit. Maybe I'll use a mixture of Gaussians instead. You can add more of these like, complexity to it until you feel comfortable that this is representative of how your data sets look like. Mm -hmm. And then now you have a prior. Mm -hmm. So now I built a prior and I do a lot of checks to make sure the prior is fits the data. And then how do I do the experiments and how do I update that prior? How much weight should I put on the prior versus the experiment results? And how do I update the prior along the way. For example, if I do a couple stages, do I do one prior and just keep updating? Or do I do each stage I have a different prior and you know, do one update? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. No, that, that, that's a great question. And I think this points towards some of the really strong advantages that Bayesianism has over the, the usual frequentist one stage type of analysis. Mm -hmm. So with a prior, you can multiply that with your likelihood do some renormalization to that. If you look up like base theorem, that's kind of like the idea what they have. So the update itself is not too complicated, except of course, like we were talking about multiplying two functions rather than mm -hmm. multiplying two numbers. So that could be a little bit complicated if your functional form is. But the good thing about this is you get to do this in multiple stages if you want to. For example, if I run my experiments and I don't want to overcommit my resources to this, I want to say, run this for just 
one day and see how that goes before I decide to put a little bit more of my uses under this test. Mm -hmm. Perfectly fine in Bayesian analysis. You don't need to worry about like issues such as like optional stopping, early stopping, that sort of stuff. Because what you would essentially do is I have a prior belief. This is my belief on the state of the world. Mm -hmm. After one step, one stage of the experiment, I now have a slightly different belief, mm -hmm. which is the posterior. Mm -hmm. And then you can use this as the starting belief mm -hmm. for your next stage and onwards. Mm -hmm. And so what that sums up to is you just keep multiplying more and more of your data, mm -hmm. your likelihood to the original prior, and then you eventually reach your final posterior that you should have mm -hmm. at the end of the experiment. Mm -hmm. How do I get the likelihood? Yeah, so the likelihood would be a function. It's actually not that this different from the probability density, at least like in the simple cases. But granted, that is going to be a function. So for example, if you collected a lot of data and you believe that it looks Gaussian enough, mm -hmm. then your likelihood would be the probability density function of the Gaussian distribution. You would multiply that whole function with your original prior distribution, do some renormalizing over there, and then that gives you a posterior. I see. So the likelihood, because I'm trying to judge the degree of freedom in each of the steps, and I feel like the estimating the likelihood function is kind of rigid. Rigid? I don't know how to explain Yeah, that. likelihood function is actually pretty rigid. Usually, you would hope that you collect enough data. Uh -huh. Most of the time, the likelihood function would just be a Gaussian function. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. That's actually because yeah, I'll, I'll summarize it in the end. But I feel like there are different stages of organization maturity uh, of what you should apply. Mm -hmm. If your organization is very sophisticated in experimentation, then people run Bayesian is a good thing. But if they are early, then <laughs> like if you if you introduce too many degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. then people can easily abuse it. Yeah, no, yeah. I definitely agree. And, and certainly like Bayesianism in terms of like being able to implement a system like that is, is a heavy lift. You're doing a lot of work. So it probably is something that you would explore when the system is pretty mature, when mm -hmm. you are in the gray area where you don't really know how to make a decision a lot of times. If you're sure about your decision, generally speaking, then why bother? <laughs> because people, yeah, I feel like this is the humbleness. People are really wrong because we're doing hard things and when we do hard things it's it's very difficult to you know just point to one decision and know it is correct if that is the right decision that everyone should already agree when there is a debate it means uh it's not as obvious as uh, you think mm. i see yeah no, no so so i guess yeah when, when when i see like um if it's very clear I, i'm referring to cases where like say your p-value is like one out of a million where yeah. you are very, very certain that what you're seeing is a real signal. Uh -huh. and, and so there's no, no good reason for you to implement a complicated system for that. Mm -hmm. But then of course, once your system matures a little bit more, when you start to run into a lot of p-values that are close to 5%, when you're really kind of on the fence about a lot of things, then Bayesianism can really shine over there. Nice. A lot of these discussions about the methodology is super useful and we can only get this kind of insight from you. But I also think we already lost like 90% of our audience by talking about these abstract terms. So do you have any documentation, reference of step-by-step -step guide of implementing Bayesian that we can summarize right here? Suppose I'm in an org that runs experiments and I want to try Bayesian, then what should I do? Okay, yeah, that, that makes it a little bit more concrete. So, yeah, something that I would say the first thing you want to start with is come up with a prior. And this could be expressed as something very simple. Like, you can say, I believe this experiment has an effect like that looks like a normal zero one variable. And that's fine, but you should definitely challenge this a little bit. For example, take a look at how this fits well to your previous experiments that are similar to this. Let me use an mm -hmm. even more concrete okay. example. Okay. Suppose I'm doing a website and I, I care about conversion mm -hmm. and I change, yeah, let's, let's change a button. I want to look at the conversion of two steps. What, I, what usually happens is 
you know, the top funnel increase, bottom funnel drop a, a bit, the multiplication of that slightly increase, about to be uh, significant. Then how should I implement a uh, Bayesian to, you know? Yeah, so since we're talking about a UI change, you may have, hopefully, a lot of past experiments that's yes. similar to this. For example, you can look at all the past times how a uh, conversion rate changed when you change uh, a button. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a lot of experiments for that, maybe look a little bit into how the past experiments that are UI changes. Mm -hmm. And if you still don't have a lot of that, maybe you should just like grab that's a cool. lot of experiments that may or may not be relevant. But the idea is you want to have in your mind a sense of how large this change is going to be. Mm -hmm. And even in the non-Bayesian setting, you kind of need to go through this exercise anyways mm -hmm. uh, for sizing reasons. But fundamentally, you want to get to a stage where you feel comfortable to mm -hmm. say, I think the results is probably going to be within this range, mm -hmm. uh, how likely it is going to fail, how likely it's going to succeed, this sort of questions answered. And if you have a lot of other teammates or cross-functional partners, those are great opportunities to talk mm -hmm. to them and see what they think too. All of this information should kind of be integrated into a prior that mm -hmm. everyone feels happy about. Past experiments, talk to everyone. And the third one, I feel like I don't even know if it's patient. Some people would do how much should we actually care about, but that is wrong in patient, right? Like for example, mm -hmm. I, I only want to ship experiments that is over 10% incremental. I don't care about anything less than 10%. But you cannot use that as a prior. Uh, so, okay, that, that is actually quite interesting. So I think the answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. So if your prior is, like if you ask around and no one believes this is going to go beyond 10%, mm -hmm. meanwhile, your decision hinges on whether it goes beyond 10% or not, then that certainly would be quite important for you to get right, like how often it's going to be bigger or smaller than 10%. Meanwhile, if the, the part of the prior that is like much smaller than 10% would matter a lot less. For example, if you ask around and got a sense of like how likely this is going to be 0% mm -hmm. versus minus 1%, when you would only ship if it's la larger than 10%, then that's kind of a moot point. You don't really need to spend too much time to figure out if it's going to be minus one or I see. zero percent. I see. Okay. Yeah. So this, this may now go to the, because we are looking at priors, we are actually designing the experiment. The 10% is not ship or not, is shall we invest in this opportunity and find out the results about. Ah, yes. So I think then what you are saying is quite relevant. If you ask around, everyone believes this is 1% opportunity. And then due to our uh, resource constraint, you should go look for 10% opportunity. That, that will be mm -hmm. an easier decision. Maybe that is already a good benchmark of what should I be start considering using Bayesian. When I have a, a new experiment, I should get my prior, make sure it's above certain thresholds of, you know, is a worthwhile kind of the ROI of doing experiments and then mm -hmm. only consider the ones above that threshold. Right, in a sense, yeah. Like that, that's going to be the same process that you probably should do before starting a project. Mm -hmm. you, you would want to have a sense of like how large this change is going to be. And a lot of times if you ask people about what they think this project is going to be, they are going to express it in terms of a prior too. They yeah. would say, I think this 50% chance of success is going to give us 4% left. Mm -hmm. So gathering a lot of these like thoughts on how likely this is going to work or not would give you some sense of like how you should set your prior. Of course, it's still going to be somewhat subjective, but at least there's a grounding on like the size, the magnitude, how likely it's going to be positive versus negative after talking to people. Okay. Yeah. All right. So first step, I establish my prior. Mm -hmm. And uh, next step? Yeah. So the second step is you want to collect your data. And generally speaking, this is going to be the same thing as what you would do in a regular experiment. So you would ask someone to design the experiment. And as part of the exercise of designing this experiment, you also want to make out some of the assumptions that you're going to make. For example, the central limit theorem holds that sort of stuff. And so after you run your experiment, that would allow you to convert all your data into mm -hmm. the likelihood function. Mm. And then the likelihood function can be combined with your prior. Uh, mm. But that's like a later step. 
Mm-hmm. How, how much of this can be integrated into a tool that can be automated? Because, yeah, like before I just need to compare two means and uh, do a t-test. Now I have to do a lot of things. Um, so it's actually not that much more, I think. For, for this part, for example, in, in the case of where we're doing a t-test, we already kind of have a belief that the data summarizes well into a Gaussian distribution. Uh-huh. That's why we use a t-test. And so the likelihood would just be Gaussian probability density function of the data that you observe. So based on the standard error that you have, based on the point estimates that you have, you construct that. And that's pretty much a good summary of your, all your data. Likelihood function, in other words, is really just a summary of your data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, what's next? Right, yeah. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to multiply these two functions. So you have your prior, which is a function. Your likelihood is also a function. Multiply them and, well, we're talking about like beliefs, right? Beliefs are probability distributions, meaning that they should always sum up to one. After multiplying those two functions, you're not going to have something that sums up to one. Mm -hmm. So you need to renormalize it, but that's pretty much it. Afterwards, you have your posterior and you can make decisions based on that. For example, you can look at your posterior and say, well, at the beginning, we agreed that if we can conclude this experiment has a 90% probability to be positive, we'll ship it. Great, look at your posterior, see if it says 90% positive on there. If it does, go ship. Otherwise, well, run the experiment for longer or something like that. What is the implication of my posterior says 70%? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, how do I interpret that? Yeah, so all these probability can be interpreted as like betting odds. Uh-huh. It's no different from, say, you going to a horse race or a lottery and say, if this horse wins, I'll give you a certain amount. But, but that is a binomial. That is, you win or not, the pr- pr- probability of winning. But in, for example, that conversion example, you are have a one percent probability of ten percent, but ninety percent probability of five percent, for example. Mm-hmm. Then right, yeah, I, I would still interpret that as betting odds. For example, like oh. you said, the outcome is like after doing all that stuff, our conclusion is there's a ninety percent chance that this is a five percent lift, uh-huh. and there's a ten percent chance this is a minus five percent lift. Uh-huh. Well, that's your bet right in front of you and the decision maker should treat it as a bet I see and figure out like if this is a reasonable bet for the company like maybe the 10% chance of losing 5% is actually a really big deal for the company and we should not do it or in a more in a bigger company that's a little bit more risk neutral you may say well on average that's positive that's great we'll we'll go with this cool so you need to kind of apply your own objective function on top of that that posterior Exactly, yeah. So yeah. Bayesianism can get you as far as like knowing what the odds are, lo- are like, yeah. but how much you care about this bet, how risk tolerant you are, that's kind of up to you. That is a great insight because that is, I feel like that is the one piece in my head that is missing because I know the distribution posterior is, but I, yeah. I never interpret this as this is a betting function. Like, you know, you know, the, you still need to take bets. Like knowing the probability distribution, you still need to take pass. Yeah. 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 In, in, in many ways, like Bayesianism is about being transparent. Like uh-huh. we're going to make a bet. So yeah. we'll make it very clear what your bet really looks like. Cool. I see. Is there any other next step? I think that's pretty much it. Of course, everything is better if you agree upon how you're going to do this entire process early on. But if not, Bayesianism is also like reasonable for you to like go back to see if your prior actually is reasonable. Mm -hmm. There might be news information that surfaces and you realize you made a bad choice for your prior. You should definitely go and correct that. Yeah, or just your best didn't pay off, like you you were unlucky. Right, that can very well happen and happens all the time, I think. (laughs) It happens all the time. Yeah, 10% probability, so it happens a lot of time. So I think to summarize, we, we learned a lot today. And just to summarize the takeaway for practitioners who want to, who think about if I should apply Bayesian or not, I think takeaway number one is Bayesian is a great technique for the reason of its transparency. The debate about prior, which is very essential, usually like under-discussed, people 
bring their own intentions and assumptions that people are not explicit about them. Mm -hmm. And because the technique is able to incorporate this information in a disciplined way and mathematical way, and uh, gives you the correct estimation if you use that, if you use the method correctly. So that's the good part about Bayesian. The bad part about it is because you need to be sophisticated, you need to uh, be mature, you need to be benevolent in your decision making. So then you really need to look at your org maturity. Can that happen? Because the method can certainly be abused if you have extra incentives of you know, just shipping the products. Right. Yeah. Definitely we agree with those points. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I hope this episode is helpful. See you next time. Bye. Cool.